My name is Kendall Richardson. What we're going to talk about today is a person that has come from trauma to victory. I was born at Harlem Hospital in New York City. Beknownst to me, I didn't know that I was adopted. So I felt like in my life, I was born day one rejected. The part of me or who I look like and who I resemble, I don't know. I didn't find out I was even adopted until I was 23, but I was adopted by two wonderful parents that raised me from, I, I guess I was a, a baby when I got adopted, I think maybe a year and a half. During my experiences of growing up, at the age of four, I was introduced to, I want to say, unnatural affections because I, I was touched by my landlord's grandson. At the age of four, we used to play house. And so at that age, I was introduced to a feminine or a woman role because that's what we used to play. The boys want to play with trucks and and they were going to work, but they wanted me to be the woman, the wife, where I would be making mud patties. And so that was the, the beginning structure of the life that I was headed in the direction of. That door was cracked where I was introduced to something I I didn't know. As kids, we are introduced to things, I guess, but known when our parents aren't there. Other kids might experience certain things that I, I didn't, but hanging with other kids, that's how it happened. I've always been different from my parents and everything because my heart was different. They wanted to work, work, work all the time, and I just wanted to do something totally different. But what was not funny, but some of my friends that I had said, Kendall, are you sure you ain't adopted? And I said, why would you say something like that? Because you're nothing like your parents. Your parents are totally different. They are great people, and you just totally wild and different so I used to shrug that off even to the to the fact of I used to watch Maury and all those type of things and I used to laugh at that because you know you don't know who your parents are you don't know who the dad is and all of that stuff but then that reality hit me I've always been different I just always felt like I was a different individual I couldn't explain it but I knew that I was a different type of person. The first time that I was introduced into my first encounter of molestation, I, I wanna say that, was my parents' landlord's grandson and some other children. We were playing house. We were downstairs in the um, backyard and they were telling me that I couldn't play with them because they're they're the men. They're they're the ones that go to work and that I was to be the woman. They told me that I needed to make mud patties, that food had to be ready for when they came home. That introduced me to a, a more feminine role. The sexual part of it was being in the closet, laying on top of me, kissing me, just like having sex. They would be making all the noises and everything. Then we had a pillow down there. So they put the pillow in, in my stomach to make sure that I would have their babies as well. That is how I was even introduced into that beginning of my life. One day it was happening. This was another day that it was happening. And my father actually was coming down the steps that day and he was looking and calling for me, but I knew something wasn't right because I felt it. I just felt like something was wrong. And so I said, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. I actually thought that. So I pushed him like off of me right before uh, my dad opened the door because we were like in the closet down there. And he said, what are y'all doing down here? I said, uh, me. It's, I made up a story of we're in here playing hide and seek. It just came out of me to be able to lie. I don't know where, where it came from, but it was almost like I knew I was about to be in trouble. I knew this was wrong, but I had to make up something so I would not get in trouble. And that is actually at four years old. It's just something that, that happened. Why I kept going back is because I, at the time I was the only child. And so this is all I knew. And these were my friends, you know, the friends that I had. I didn't have any other friends. These were people that 
lived in the same house that I was in. So that that's really all I knew. And so this is the games that they played. So I didn't know anything else. How things progressed in my life, my dad got a job. At, at a major airline so we ended up moving away and landed in Virginia. I had a neighbor who lived about two doors down. He was the first one on the block with Nintendo. One day he was like, um, can you come up in the attic? And so when I got up there, it was like thousands of Playboy magazines. His father collected like a thousand Playboy magazines. He opened it up and showed me. I didn't know what that was because that's not something I've ever seen in my life. He unzipped his pants and told me to put my mouth on that and I was like no I'm not I'm not going to do that. He said just come on just come on and just do it. One of the ways that he he tricked me was I liked video games at that age. I mean I was eight. That was the way that he would get me to come over there and, and do that. So at the age of eight I was introduced to Playboy magazines. I was introduced to oral sex. I was introduced to shame and guilt it was one time that we were actually together and he was getting so bold with it that he made me do it in his house his mom was washing dishes and I'm like I can't do that well your mom is right here literally five feet away she could have looked out the window I cried, started crying and he told me to get away you cry baby I don't hang out with cry babies and that was the moment that I felt crushed because this was this was supposed to be my friend. And because I didn't do what he wanted me to do, it was so bad that I, I left there and I went to the park and I went and laid on the merry-go-round for hours and just hours and hours. And I laid there because I was so confused. I was hurt. I was broken. I, I didn't understand any of this. So... One day my my dad came to look for me and told me it was time for dinner and to come on and he's like, well, what's wrong with you? And I just said nothing. But the young man must have known or felt like I was about to say something. And he actually went and came. Soon as he saw us, he came to my house. And I was like, Lord, please, like, don't. I don't want to go back over there. And he was like, can, can Kendall come? Can he come and play? And um, my dad told him no, because he's getting ready to eat dinner. And um, I never went back over there that day because that broke me. It was a learned behavior. These were learned behaviors that I shouldn't have. And all of those were learned behaviors. The shame and the guilt, the manipulation, the, the bribery, all of those things entered my life at the age of eight. The next trauma that I, I dealt with was with my grandmother's next door neighbor's son. We were outside one day just playing basketball. It was a group of people. The one that did what he did to me, he actually ended up raping me on the basketball court, kept feeling on my behind during it, kept pressing his penis upon me, just doing it without people really knowing because you're playing basketball. It's like a contact sport, but he just kept doing it. And so um, how he got me, I'm 12. I'm still in that video game stages and he was like come on cuz I didn't I was at my grandmother's house so we didn't have the Sega game system and I wanted to play Sonic the Hedgehog when that happened he got me to come over there and actually when we went in there the lights were out and his father was actually sitting on the couch when we went in the house he took me in the back to where his supposed to be room is to play the game but he actually took me in the bathroom and um asked me to perform oral sex on him and i told him i don't i don't want to do that and i actually began to cry because now i'm in like feeling like i'm in the same boat that I was in eight years. I come to find myself in the same cycle again. When he told me that he balled up his, his fist and held it to my head and said, you are going to do it. So he told me that if you don't do it, I'm going to tell your parents that you tried to suck my dick. So, you know, my parents, my dad was very strict. So I had to choose and I wasn't going to deal with my dad. So I did what I complied to what he did. But now as I sit here to, to even realize that this last tragedy 
that actually happened in my life, I realized that it was the same trick, the same traumas that happened at eight and the same thing that I ha happened at four, but it was just progressing into different avenues and so that's where the uh, I learned aggression from him I performed oral sex until he ejaculated in my mouth that was very traumatic for me it bothered me for a long time in my life the situation now is I actually own the home that I was raped in that I was 12 years old. I actually own it. I'm the owner of that home now. So that was one of the ways that I victoriously have overcame because when my parents bought it because it was next door to my grandmother and I was angry with my parents for even wanting to buy the house because at that time I already told them what happened to me and I don't want that. Why would you do that knowing what happened to me? Why would you do that? And so I had to figure out, well, what, what purpose does it benefit me to actually own the home that I was raped in? To let me know that I have dealt with this so long that now the thing that tried to destroy me, I have overcome it. In a way, it has helped me to deal with the, the, the point of that trauma and that the trauma does not have control over me anymore. I believe that that generation before me has been forced to deal with what their emotions and, and no outlets for it. And I, I, I just don't agree with that. I feel like it needs to be talked about. It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be expressed. It needs to be explained. But my parents are like, it happened. Don't don't bring it back up. Just just leave it alone. And I never feel like that's how you deal with traumas. I don't think you should just it happened. So get over it. The traumas that I experienced caused a lifetime of various issues, especially in my teenage years, because it caused me to question one, who I was two, what I wanted to do in my life because I felt like I didn't know. I didn't have any goals and aspirations of really where I wanted to go. And three, it challenged my sexual preferences. The behaviors of my past began to haunt me because they were rooted on the inside of me. Those seeds started to grow because, of course, introduced to Playboys and stuff later on it progressed into pornography and different type of things i also turned around and became an abuser the same things that was happening to me i turned around and started doing that to younger boys myself i feel remorseful and sorry to the people that i've hurt and caused in that manner because that is not the way that you should be dealing with things but I didn't know because I was a child myself. I still was underage. I was able to go to church and get the spiritual help. I still never really was able to talk to my parents, to talk to them on how they felt about my behaviors because we didn't really actually talk about it. I've never really talked to my parents on how it made them feel for their child with this type of behavior. Watching other people and on TV and stuff, I know how angry people's families are when these situations erupt. I didn't want to be known as like a child molester or any of those type of things because I didn't wake up every day thinking about assaulting anybody. Those were the times that it just happened. I'm very sorry to the people that I affected in that way. And I feel like the, the behaviors from my past and the traumas that happened to me became the monster that I, I had become. I finally found out I was adopted when I was 23 years old. My cousin just was, and we were in the kitchen and she was like, Kendall, do you know that you was adopted? So what I did was I called my mom and I asked her and she actually left work and came home. And that's the day that I actually found out that I really was adopted. I still don't know who my biological parents are. Those are the questions that I, I wanted to know and 
they weren't willing to give me those answers. Even to today, they still won't give me the answers that I was seeking. My whole life was a lie. My whole life was full of tragedy from the beginning. Like everything to finding out that I was adopted to these traumas. It was like I didn't have any breath to breathe as a human being. It was so, it was like one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing. And I said, who can actually live like this? I was angry. I was angry for a long time. I was angry at them. And not that I wanted to leave them because they were my parents, but I was angry because you lied to me. I still don't even know the parameters of why I was adopted as a child. I don't know any of it. My dad said to me, just be glad that you were born. And ever since he told me that, I left it alone and, and, and stopped. I even tried to ask my grandmother. And I'm hoping later on in life as I go out and I go through this journey that I will find out the truth that I will find out because it's always the question on my, the back of my mind who my family is through all of the hurts and pains I begin to journal stuff and that's how my journey began to start in, in healing I wrote real poems about real situations that happened in my life and then what I did was as I started to study the Bible I began to look in the Bible on the same situation that I dealt with and then I could find them in the Bible. So I ended up putting them together and then I realized that my heart, my spirit was dirty, it was nasty, it was it was perverted, it was it was not human the love that God really wants us to display to other people so he began to give me a heart and that's how I started to write my books then I got into radio then I became a minister then I started a nonprofit organization called the grapevine HIV AIDS organization where our mission was to educate youth parents pastors and community members concerning HIV and I started talking to youth about responsibility for your own body and then I started writing columns for overflow magazines. It's just been a blessing and I, I do things in the community to help the seniors. Every, everything I possibly could do to help somebody else is, is on my journey.